Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Responses to Critics. Uh, Imam Karim Abu Zaid. This is part two of our response to Imam Karim. And uh, let's begin. Uh, in minute two uh, of Imam Karim's video, he mentioned the first question everyone asks. If you don't follow Hadith and Sunnah, how do you pray? Uh, the Salah, prayers, is uh, an institution within Islam. All you have to do is, if you just go to any bookshop, just open a book, Introduction to Islam, it's very likely you will see a picture or pictures of people praying. And that this prayer institution is very much beloved by the Muslims. However, if we are to go back to the Quran, we will see that the Quran does not explicate how to pray. Uh, some Quranists believe the Quran alludes or refers to the prayers. And that prayer is an ongoing practice. They, they, they uh, rely on chapter 2 verse 125, uh, which has a phrase, uh, Take uh, from the position of Ibrahim the prayer performed, they call it. I personally disagree with that. But that is how some Quranists look at it. However, the, the question to ask is this. Does Imam Karim uh, have the justification to say that he has the right mode of prayers? Uh, I don't think so. Because in I'm not even referring to the Shia and the Sunni here. I'm talking within the institution of Sunnism itself there are multiple differences in how to pray now this is very ironic because uh, the prophet um, is recorded to have said in, in sahih bukhari pray as you see me as you have seen me pray so that makes prayer something visual as you see me pray the word uh, is used there yeah? to see so this being the case how can there be physical differences in how the Sunnis pray. You know, the, the Sunnis, when they pray, some of them put their hands at, on their chest, others put their hands on their bellies, others put their hands on the side. These are very overt visual differences. How did these visual differences come about? If, by the time the Prophet died, there were at least 10,000 witnesses to his uh, khutbah al widah or his, his um, farewell speech. There were 10,000 witnesses. So if he performed the prayer there, 10,000 people would have seen him and surely where his hands were positioned, that would have been very clear. Yet today, we will find the Salafis uh, saying to their followers, don't pray behind um, a Hanafi Imam. Why? Because that Hanafi Imam does not follow the right method. He is a muqtadi, an innovator. He does not follow the right method. So the Sunnis themselves cannot agree on the right method. And the reason is this. There is no set method. The Quran gives uh, the flexibility for us and how we establish the connection with Allah. And if you read the Quran by itself, you will see there is a, a multiplicity of ways which you can connect with Allah. And that is Salat. So... Uh, yeah, Imam, I'm afraid, you know, you don't have that clear answer either. What you're trying to imply is that, although, you know, Quranists don't have it, uh, you're trying to imply that the Quranists don't have it because we don't follow the Sunnah. Even if you do follow the Sunnah, you don't have the answer. So that's minute two. Uh, in minute three, uh, the Imam says that, uh, hadith and Sunnah explains the Quran. Explains. So if the Quran says, for example, Wama anta alayhim bijabarin, chapter 50, verse 45, you are not over them a compeller. Yet the Sunnah, or rather the Hadith in this case, from Bukhari, says, Man badalla, man badalla deenahu, katallahu. Whoever changes his deen killed him. Is this an explanation of you are not over them a compeller? This is not an explanation. This is a refutation. Could the Prophet 
have actually denied the rule of no compulsion and practice compulsion himself? No. He could not have done this. So the Sunnah and Hadith can claim to accept, uh, explain the Quran, but it's not a necessity. In fact, uh, much of what I read in the Hadith literature, I see it as a subversion from the Quran. Whereas the Quran um, promotes a very active existence with the Hadith and Sunnah. You, you've created an, an, an extra space called religion where you, you, pro you have your own rites and rituals and that becomes deen. You know the Arabs, they, they, they say deen wa dunya, deen and the world. The Quran does not have this. And the reason is the Quran has its own approach to religion. Hadith and Sunnah does not explain the Quran. And this also raises a question. Does the Quran need explication? Does it need explanation? Um, I think it would be good if we, we looked at chapter 10 verse 15. Which says, وَإِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا بَيِّنَاتٍ لَقَالَ الَّذِي لَا يَرْجُنَا لِقَائِنَا أَعْتِي بِقُرْآنٍ خَيْرِ هَذَا So, this being the case, this being the case, these people actually understood what was being recited. Uh, sorry, let me, let me translate that for you. And when, uh, when it is recited upon them, our clear verses, clear, clear verses, those who uh, do not rely on the meeting with us say, bring us a Quran other than this. Why didn't they say, I'm sorry, we don't really understand this. They, these are disbelievers by you, mind you. Yeah? They, they don't believe in the revelation. But they say, well, bring us a Quran other than this. Or change it. That's another part of the verse. They understood it. The problem wasn't understanding. The problem was their heart wasn't inclined to it. So, uh, Mr. Imam, I'm afraid uh, you can't actually justify that. The Quran is clear. It, is, it requires study, agreed. But it does not need Hadith and Sunnah to explain it. In fact, lots of times Hadith and Sunnah contradict it. Right. Um, then he goes on to... Um, Minute four, where he says, uh, if you reject the sunnah, what he quoted in Arabic was, if you reject the sunnah, you are rejecting the millah. Millah, uh, he would understand it as religion. In other words, the sunnah makes up the whole religion. If you reject it, you're rejecting the religion. Does he know how many hadith Bukhari rejected? Bukhari rejected over 99% of the hadith he encountered. That's how many false hadith he encountered. So, if this is true, if this story is true, it, it does sound like an exaggeration. But if this story is true and the Sunnis stand by this story, then how is it possible that, and if we uh, have doubts for hadith, we don't, we are not afforded the same kind of uh, understanding as Bukhari. Bukhari came 200 years after the Prophet. 200 years, mind you. If he came 200 years after the Prophet, how could he have possibly known this? How could he have known this? There is no way. All you have are a bunch of names. It's so easy to take a bunch of names with no signature, mind you. There's no way of verifying anything. It's so easy to take a bunch of names and stick it to another hadith. It's so easy to do that. Especially if you know which set of names are currency. It's almost like forging banknotes. Except you don't need to forge the, the intricate artistry of a particular note. All you have to do is have the same names. So I don't understand how this can be called the science of hadith. You know, it's, it's um, rather difficult uh, for me to understand that. So. Uh, I think this is all we can say for uh, part two, as we're kind of running out of time now. Uh, please tune in to part three, where we will finish our refutation of Imam Karim Abu Zayed. Thanks uh, for viewing.